Hey everybody, TBG Hunter here, and welcome back to more Sly 2 Band of Thieves. Last time we had a bittersweet ending to our adventure with the gang. We took out the clockwork parts, we took out Neela, we've ended basically the claw gang's reign of terror and their use against the, of the clockwork parts. However, it did come at a cost. Sly had to turn himself into Carmelita to help clear her name with Interpol. Bentley lost the use of his legs, and Murray just wasn't the same after this adventure. Now, you might be wondering, well, since our adventure is done, why are we back in the game? Well, there is some bonus content as well as some things in the past versions of this game and also the 100% reward you get for this. So, without further ado, let's head off to my favorite chapter in the entire game and let's get started on this thing. Once again, back in the Great White North, so what you want to do to get your 100% reward is you want to pull up your pause menu and you want to input the code of right, left, right, left, R1, left. And doing so, if you've gotten 100% in the game, meaning you've gotten all the clue bottles, you've gotten all the vaults, you've gotten all the gadgets, you've done all the missions, and even done some of the other small side secret stuff in some of the episodes of the game, your reward for 100% is... The Mega Jump gadget that you got from the end of the game. With it, you're able to do a very high jump. It's about basically the exact same gadget you got with the super jump pack that Bentley gave you during the penultimate uh, mission before the end of the game. And yeah, you're able to clear some pretty high distances with this. It's actually a lot of fun to use, and I'm actually really happy that you get this gadget. And also, you can also revisit past levels in the game to just hop around to your heart's content. Even though they didn't count towards it uh, for 100%, you can go back and snag any of the missing treasures that you might have gotten. And one of the best things about the Mega Jump gadget is the fact that it takes next to no gadget points to use. So you can jump around to your heart's content and not have to worry about running out of points anytime soon. Back in beautiful Perry, it is time for us to go over the gadgets that we unfortunately didn't have a chance to go over because, well, time constraints of the LP, and also I just honestly forgot to actually show them off during the main LP. That is, of course, Sly's Shadow Power move, Murray's El Diablo Fire Slam, and Bentley's Temporal Lock move. Sly's Shadow Power is basically the exact same move he had from the first game, with a little bit of a boost to it. While you don't move anywhere at near as slow as you did in the first game, uh, you still can't attack with it, but guards won't see you, nor neither flashlight guards nor regular guards, and it's actually pretty useful to sneak past guards that, that if you're carrying a treasure, but you've seen like it's a very heavily trafficked area, it's honestly one of the most invaluable things you can get from the vaults. Murray's Diablo Fire Slam move is basically not the best. Honestly, if I had to pick between this or the Raging Inferno flop, I would still go with the flop just because, well, you get the flop all over the place. But the Fire Slam is also still a somewhat useful move. Basically, you grab a dude, once you have him in your hands, uh, just activate the gadget ability, and Murray will slam the enemy down onto the ground, creating a fiery explosion around you. It is actually pretty good uh, to use it uh, around areas with a lot of breakables, that way you can get the most coins and also some health packs to replenish the gadget ability and it's also somewhat useful against guards seeing as how it is considered a fire attack so aside from the toucan guards in the final chapter of the game uh, it's basically a one shot for any and all type of guards in the game bentley's temporal lock is basically slice ultimate move from the end of the first game but just you know given the bentley this time it uses a lot of gadget power to use, but it is still really invaluable if you need to find a way to get away from a lot of dudes chasing after you. It basically freezes every single guard in the entire chapter that you're in, and it actually does last a pretty decent time, so it's really useful. However, the cost for it is pretty high, which, you know, control over time and space does ha have a pretty high cost to it. And it is also a pretty taxing gadget on your gadget meter. Well, I never thought I'd find myself back in this place again, but, well, here we are. Now, before we go off to see why I came back to this chapter specifically, there are two special gadgets that Sly can unlock only through codes. That being Tom from Toonami and the ability to speed up time. 
To unlock Tom, all you have to do, go to the pause menu and press left, left, down, right, left, right. Doing so unlocks the titular host for use in the field. All you got to do, find some guards nearby, toss them down, and he'll get their attention by bouncing up and down and shouting at them to get their attention. Mostly shouting about peanuts for some reason. If you're wondering why Tom does appear in this, it's because Sly actually had a very heavy promotion during the Toonami Block City era. So it was a nice little uh, crossover thing they did, and this isn't even the only game that they did a crossover with Toonami. Now, to unlock the Time Rush ability, all you gotta do, once again, is go to the pause menu and press down, down, up, down, right, left. And doing so, just like Tom, permanently unlocks this ability's use for Sly. It's honestly just there for a challenge mode, to be honest. It, it speeds up all guard patrols, it speeds up Sly's movement, combat, and also basically any function in the game. It also does have a pretty draining use on the gadget meter, unlike Tom does. So, don't go a little overboard if you want to speed up the clock for your playthroughs, but it's there. I guess seeing as how Sly has the ability to slow down time, it would also make sense for him to have the ability to speed things up. Now, on to the real reason why we came back to Jailbreak. I'm not 100% sure if this is a glitch or if this is actually a supposed easter egg in the game, but if you remember from the giant water tower that is totally not a giant attack robot that you were able to take out with a lightning strike, if you go up to it, walk away for it for a little bit, and make sure your back is turned down this rooftop edge, you can actually see its eyes light up and... I guess grow with distance because that's kind of a thing that happens with this game and enemies at a distance. But yeah, this thing's still kicking. It's still functional, just not mobile to do anything against you. And I was thinking that this was a visual glitch, seeing as how it just appears at this very specific moment. But seeing as how its eyes stay lit up for a little bit if you're facing it before fading away just to uh, try to sell the illusion, makes me think that there's still more to this robot than meets the eye. Returning back to the Contessa's estate, it's time for a bit of a blast from the past, seeing as how this crypt held more than just ghosts inside its walls. Now, what you want to do is you want to smash the suits of armor in the back part of the room. Uh, first things first though, make sure that all the enemies in this area are cleaned out before you decide to do anything. Hop up onto the pedestal and pull out your Banaki Kam, turn around and face the priestess's casket, and after a short while, you will see the face of not only not only the antagonist of Rocket Robot on Wheels, Jojo, but also Rocket himself. It's very out of place, and it's very hard to realize that you have to do this very specific thing to get this little Easter egg to show up, but it's still really nice to show that Sucker Punch still, you know, remembered the face of their very first game. Now, back on the main menu, you might have been noticing on some of these episode titles that the Carmelita's badge periodically appears down in the corner, and you might have been wondering what happens if I press the square button while the badge flashes on screen. Well, if you press square on episode 1's badge, you get a nice little animated movie basically showcasing the main characters of the series.
Pressing square on the badge for episode three gives you this. Yo, check it out. It's me, Lala, chasing down PS2 Sly Cooper. Sly and his crew are back and they're bringing down the house with the biggest heist ever. Yo, slow it down. Hey, please, I dig rappers, not raccoons. You guys at home, keep it right here to see who's at number one. Episode 5's badge gives you the trailer to the game that was all over Toonami during the time before the game's official release. So, Bentley, what's the job? Well, Clockwork's parts have been stolen, and we are the prime suspects on Inspector Fox's list. Ah, she's really quite lovely when she's angry. Sly, we've got to clear our day. Oh, sorry. And the Marinators got you covered. This is our biggest job yet, so we really have to work together, but the whole job is blown if we don't have someone at the controls. So, are you in? Rated E for everyone. And finally, and personally, my favorite out of all these little badge secrets is Episode 7's badge. For completing Episode 7 and clicking on the badge icon, you get treated to a behind the scenes making of the game, which honestly is something that more games nowadays really need to showcase because it really does show how much work goes into making these crafts in the worlds and making the characters. And also, you know, you get to see the voice actors and voice actresses for this game. Tell me about Sly Cooper. Well, Sly Cooper is a thief and he's a different type of thief. He's cool, he's tough, but he's got to be lovable at the same time. And he's also a really good looking guy and he has a sexy voice. Just, arf. I'd say about a month into development, we came up with a one-sentence description that really has guided the development of the product. And the one sentence was, Sly and the gang work together to pull off a string of big heists. When I say heist, I mean like classic Hollywood heist film kind of heist, where the last third of the film was all about this big, spectacular, elaborate crime involving many thieves working together to do something huge. We knew we wanted to do something a little different than the first slide. We wanted to um, broaden some of the gameplay elements, broaden the environments, have more characters in the game. You actually use all the different characters' skills in different ways and different combos, and it, it really makes for a really fun experience. There's a backstabbing, there's a betrayal, there's a jailbreak. Thiefiness is different things to different people. For some people, it's um, being sneaky. For some people, it's being agile. We want Sly the Thief to really encompass all of these things. It is really fun and really thiefy to be on the top of the roof, scaling across the level, running across wires, looking down at guards looking for you. I think we all would love to be able to do the things Sly does, just to be able to jump from rooftop to rooftop, land like a cat on top of a wire and scamper down it. If I did that, I'd break an ankle. <laughs> Two things that we try to keep in mind when we start any drawing of Sly is, number one would be definitely the silhouette, creating a strong silhouette, which is especially important in animation. Um, and number two is motion. He's always kind of forward moving low to the ground um, and try to get a lot of motion and usually just start off with a couple of lines and let that be sort of his overall arcing motion. Um, it'll be like his spine and his supporting leg and off of that just sort of compose where his details are gonna be. I haven't stolen anything yet. Sly is the charismatic leader of the band of thieves. He's got that moxie, he's got that skill under pressure that makes him special. Sly Cooper is deeply involved with two ladies, Inspector Carmelita Fox and Constable Neela. He's kind of flirty with both of them. Why don't you and I go out on the town? And their relationship is actually one of the major narrative threads for the whole game. We're on for that date in Bollywood. Freeze, Cooper. Inspector Fox 
as beautiful and unpredictable as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable, you always return to the scene of the crime. Let me out that security computer. Presto, all clear. Bentley is the brain of the organization, the guy with the gadgets. Um, he's just really fun. People have said that I resemble the character that I did the voice for Bentley, and I guess I can see that. Um, I mean, I am mostly human, but there's a little part of me that is a turtle. Any good heist needs someone who's gonna work the bombs, and clearly that's Bentley. Now head back to the safe house with those pictures and let's get a plan together. Bentley really looks like Bentley and Murray kind of looks like Murray and they act like it. If people say that Bentley is the brains, Murray is definitely the bra. It's all about freedom, you know? Just, just let it go. Yeah, baby! Let it all hang out! Murray is like big and a brawler. It's kind of the muscle of the crew. Murray can lift these guys up above his head and toss them into flames or into the water or off of buildings and things like that. And it's kind of all manner of slapsticky ways for them to be dispatched. The Murray scores again! Murray wants to do things the way Sly would do them, but it's sort of Murray's version of that, and it's a little bit oafier. He's really trying to make himself really small, too, because, of course, he's got a lot to hide. This is a universe in pantslessness. <laughs> Hence, no pants. <laughs> No pants. <laughs> yeah, I don't wear pants. Um, and I like to hang out with uh, little furry animals. That's what makes it so real. They're just being themselves. This game, we really wanted it a lot more to be about doing something rather than just going somewhere. And as a result, one of the things we really focused on in this game was to really work on the AI. Sly is able to handle different classes of enemies in the game, and it tends to be that the ones that are dangerous to him um, walk the you know walk the streets and are patrolling and guarding the areas. The guards are just more intelligent and more sophisticated, which makes getting from point A to point B in the world uh, both unique and interesting for every player who goes through it. No two players will have the same experience traveling through the Sly world. When we get a level from the 3D modelers, we have a lot of communication between them during the process of when it's being built before it's handed off. And um, basically, we have a great foundation to work with because you need a, a good 3D foundation to put the maps on. For, for, for us, the environments, we really wanted to make them beautiful and interesting, but never more important than Sly. Not just artistically, but also game-wise, they should be fun to play in. Very jungle gym. They should feel very stealthy. You should feel when you're playing in these worlds, I can't believe I'm getting to do this. You and the rest of the Claw Gang have to be stopped. Oh, let's dance! Oh. Here, I am king. Oh, it's tough being this tough. You learn too much about the Claw Gang. Immortality is what I seek. Dimitri is this lounge lizard who runs a CD nightclub. He's a master forger slash counterfeiter. Look, I'm sure that two cats in a bag like us can work something out. The coolest part about Dimitri is how he talks. English is his second language, and he learned all his English from watching uh, hip hop videos. Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? John grew up poor on the streets of Calcutta, he turned to selling illegal spices. He's come up in the world and he's basically trying to buy his way into royalty. He's just a low-level street thug in rich robes. All I see is a fat, pathetic weakling. The Contessa is a creepy spider, an expert in hypnosis, um, and works for Interpol, the police agency. She decides to open up this rehabilitation clinic for criminals. But wait, it's just a scam because it's really a front so that she can hypnotize criminals into telling her where they've hidden their loot. You're an ignorant child playing dress up in his father's legacy. Oh, I know all about you and the Cooper clan. Oh. I... <laughs> <laughs> Jean Besson was a prospector. He got buried in an avalanche for 100 plus years and he thought out and he's decided that he's going to push back the wilderness. He loves strip mining. He loves clear cutting of trees. He's just a product of his time. He just happens to be living 100 years later. So his entire mission in life is to tame the West. As my father said, the only good fish is an eaten fish. Arpeggio was a small flightless bird, and because he can't fly, he's completely enthralled with all the flying machines of Da Vinci. 
when they <laughs> I was playing the parrot, I was kind of like, oh, they'll love it when I come walking in. Hi, I'm the parrot. Uh, six foot four and very large man plays a little tiny crazy parrot. A pigeo. Eternal life. That's what I crave. Eternal life. <gasps> Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Hello, Sucker Punch Productions. Productions. Hello, Are you recording? No, no. That's awful. I think one of the real big strengths of Sucker Punch is it's a very creative team that tends to push themselves. What's this wire here? That is to make sure that Nate is working. It's always been a collaborative effort all the way through the pipeline. And the pipeline is set up like that specifically so that everybody gets their chance to inject themselves into what they're doing. Hey, how's it going? We've been really lucky in that we've just gotten really great people on board to, to do the kinds of things that we need to do making a, a really great game. <laughs> well, we're crazy. Do you want any dialect or anything to make it appeal to the European gaming market? Raccoons, squirrels, turtles. Sly Cooper 2 is the finest game you'll ever play this year. <laughs> Stop. <laughs>might have noticed that the badge also flashes on episode 8 and if you're wondering why it is here even though it is not an odd numbered level it's just basically to watch the credits again now before we end things off there's still one special thing i've wanted to show off since the start of this project but to do so we have to go back back before all this happened back before this adventure even took off back before this game was even made we have to go back to the past no you idiot we went too far back Ugh, just take us forward in time and let's just get this moving okay what the uh, no you fool you went too far ahead uh, listen, take us back to the year 2004, November 2nd. Okay, can you do that? Cool. There we go, much better. Now, some of you may be wondering why I'm in the third entry of Sony's Golden Bolt. Well, in Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal, when you go to the main menu, you want to press L1, R1, L2, R2. Doing so gives you access to a secret demo of Sly 2. Not only that, but you get access to the beta build of the game, with some minor changes, but they are quite noticeable and I wanted to show off these changes before we ended this series off proper. The demo starts off in the museum prologue. The first thing you'll probably notice is the health bar in the top left. In the beta build of Sly 2, Sly and the gang's health was based off percentage and not just it being a solid health bar. you also probably notice that there isn't even a gadget meter at the bottom because either the gadgets just weren't going to be a thing in Sly 2 or they just were going to run on Sly 1's logic of just having unlimited use. Aside from the health bar change, the prologue plays out basically the same as the final version with it just ending right as before you get to the rooftop chase. Next mission in the demo is following Dimitri, which, much like the prologue, is basically the same as it is in the final version, aside from Sly's job complete icon being much different, and also instead of him writing the name of the Thievius Raccoonus, he just puts his little icon in there. Bentley is up next, and if you notice from his intro description, instead of using his crossbow, he instead was armed with a laser gun. The discotheque is also a lot less lively than it is in the final version, and even smashing the instruments doesn't give you those greasy sweet tunes. Murray's up next to show us what he's got with Silence the Alarms. The mission has two major differences in that being the intro dialogue, which I went over in the LP. Hey, Bentley, you don't have to talk to me like I'm a child. Well, I'm just trying to make it crystal clear for you. What's clear to me is that you're not sure I can pull this off. Look, if I'm the guy for the job, then I'm the guy. 
Don't worry. The Murray will lay waste to these alarms and emerge triumphant. And the fact that guards, as I've come to learn, don't swarm you as much as they do in the final version, so you can't really rely on them to take out the second and third of the alarm horns instead of you'll have to rely on the stuff you find around the level to do so. Or go off and find a flashlight guard. Or a regular guard. Either or. The final mission in the demo is theater pickpocketing with Sly, with some slight difference on how you can't attack guards as they are in constant communication via walkie-talkie, as stated by Bentley. And honestly speaking, I kind of wish that they kept this in as it was a much more believable reason as to why you can't take out key guards instead of every single key in the game being ultra-fragile. And that's it for all the secrets in Sly, or, well, all the secrets I was able to find anyways. Thanks everybody for joining me on this nostalgia trip, as this LP has not only strengthened my love for this series, but also for this game in particular. Will we see the return of Sly in the game in the future? Maybe. Possibly. Probably. But after this adventure, the game definitely deserves a nice long break. And uh, with that, I will see you all in the next series. Take care, everybody.